Please be seated. Today I want to talk about one word. One word spoken by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as he hung, uh, bleeding, dying, suffocating, suffering on that cross. One final word before, as John tells us in his gospel, Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Tetelestai. The Greek word is tetelestai. Or in English, it is finished. It is finished. Now, I don't know about you, but nothing in my life ever feels like it's finished. The yard is never finished. Paying the bills is never finished. Trying to stay healthy is never finished. Pastoring a church is never finished. Uh, Trying to stay married is never finished. Raising children is never finished. One of my favorite movies is the 1989, I'm going to call it classic, uh, Parenthood with Steve Martin, Diane Wiest, a young Keanu Reeves, a young Joaquin Phoenix. Remember Rick Moranis? He was big in the 80s. He's in that movie. There's one scene in which Frank Buckman asks his younger son, Gil, played by Steve Martin, for some advice. In the course of that conversation, he shares with his son something true and profound. Frank says to his son, Gil, you know, when you were two years old, we thought you had polio. For a week, we didn't know. I hated you for that. I hated having to go through that. Caring, worrying, pain. It's not for me, the dad says. And it's not like that all ends when you're 18 or 21 or 41 or 61. It never, never ends. It's like your Aunt Edna's backside. It goes on forever, and it's just as frightening. (laughs) There is no end zone. You never cross the goal line, spike the ball, and do your touchdown dance. Never. If you're a parent, you know that that's true. And I wonder if anyone can relate to that sentiment. Life goes on. The to-do list goes on. Carrying and worrying and pain go on seemingly forever and it's scary. Life is scary. The world is a mess. And yet, what does Jesus say on the cross? To tell us die. It is finished. It is accomplished. On the cross, Jesus accomplishes everything. He finishes everything. Dr. Rod Rosenblatt was a professor of theology at Concordia University in California for many years, and someone once asked him, Rod, when did you get saved? Which is another way of asking, when did you become a Christian? When did you come to put your faith in Jesus? When did you inherit eternal life? Rod, when did you get saved? His reply, 2,000 years ago, to tell us die. It is finished. Let me read you another quote, one of my favorites from the Episcopal priest, theologian, author Robert Ferrer Capon, who passed away in 2013. He's writing about the Reformation, that moment in 16th century Europe when people rediscovered the gospel, the authentic Christian 
message. You know, when the Lutheran and Presbyterian and Anglican, you know, we're an Anglican church, Episcopal church, when those churches were born. But what he writes, it really applies to anyone who discovers or rediscovers the good news of God's unconditional love and grace for sinners like you and me. Here's what Capon says. The Reformation was a time when men went blind, staggering drunk because they had discovered in the dusty basement of late medievalism a whole cellar full of 1,500-year-old, 200-proof grace, bottle after bottle of pure distillate of Scripture, one sip of which would convince anyone that God saves us single-handedly. The word of the gospel, after all those centuries of trying to lift yourself into heaven by worrying about the perfection of your bootstraps, suddenly turned out to be a flat announcement that the saved were home before they started. What he's saying, what the Bible says, is that the, the story of our lives may be long and winding and even treacherous, but the end is not in doubt. God has saved us single-handedly. We are home before we start. To tell us die, it is finished. Or here's what the writer of Hebrews says. He's quoting the prophet Jeremiah who wrote 600 years before Jesus' life and death. Hebrews says, this is the covenant that I will make with them, with us. This is the covenant that God makes with us. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. It's over. It's finished. Jesus has died. Jesus has paid the price. God is not keeping score. He has forgotten all of your sins, past, present, future. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking. Really? All my sins? What about that one horrible thing I did or that I'm currently doing or that I'm tempted to do? What about those sins that I can't seem to shake, can't seem to stop committing? And honestly, maybe I don't even really want to. They're they're kind of fun. You know, maybe I like this particular sin, even though I know it's wrong, even though I know it hurts me and others. What about that? Surely God doesn't forget that. Well, first, it's even worse than you think. You are way worse than you could imagine. What does Isaiah say about us in today's reading? All we like sheep have gone astray. Every word one has turned to his own way. We all go our own way. We do our own thing. One final quote, again from Capon. The notion that people won't sin as long as you keep them well supplied with guilt and holy terror is a bit overblown. Giving the human race religious reasons for not sinning is about as useful as reading lectures to an elephant in rut. <laughs> we have always, in the pinches, done what we damn well pleased, and God has let us do it. His answer to sin is not to scream, stop that, but to shut up once and for all on the subject in Jesus' death. Or as the prophet Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, laid on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. The death of Jesus, the death of God, it's enough. It's enough even for you, even for me.
tetelestai. It is finished. Amen.